This one? This one. Let me set this up, ladies. You guys can hear me? Yeah? Awesome. Okay, so we are in chapter 16 of Gentle and Lowly, which is titled The Lord, The Lord. And Ortland is going to draw out who God is from Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, which is a very familiar passage to many of us. And we're going to turn there soon. But before we do, I would love to share a quote by John Owen. I have stumbled across this about a year ago, and it was quite impactful for me. And I find that what he is able to touch on here will help kind of start us on our way today. And this is from his book, Communion with the Triune God. I did print it out on your paper in size 8 font. Sorry. Um, But he is speaking of believers here. And he is showing the importance of rightly understanding who God is. And he says, quote, It is a misapprehension, a misunderstanding of God that makes any to run from him. God loses our company by our lack of insight into his love. Would you continually behold his everlasting tenderness and compassion, his thoughts of kindness that have been from of old, his present gracious acceptance, then you could not bear an hour's absence from him. Whereas now, perhaps, you cannot stay with him one hour. End quote. Why do we so often struggle to sit with this gracious God in his life-giving word, throughout the week. So much so that we need accountability. We ask for accountability for it. Why do we often doubt God's acceptance of us? We can be skeptical of his genuine care for us. We think that we actually need to perform or work for more of his love, for more of his favor. How is it that we run to idols for comfort in our trials? or in our pain, and we so quickly find more help and value in what man has to say than what God has already said and what he has already promised. Why is this? It is true that our flesh is weak, right? We are sinners and we are prone to wander, but that acknowledgement alone isn't helpful It's not going to change us. As Gus even said earlier today, may we be changed as we behold by faith who God is. Many of our troubles and our anxieties and our sin are rooted in the reality that we don't know him. We don't actually believe what he has said about himself. Is he the God of all comfort? Right? Is he the source of all wisdom, the greatest counselor? Does he truly possess all power and does he love us? Does he desire to work his power on our behalf to help us? What we genuinely believe about the answer to those questions will radically change how we live our lives, how we trust God, how we fellowship with him. Psalm 9 verse 10 says, those that know you will put their trust in you. But as John Owen mentions, it's a misapprehension of God. It's a lack of insight into his love that causes any of us to run away from him or unable to spend even an hour with him. So today um, we will consider many truths that are very familiar to us. Specifically, we'll focus on the precious reality that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And as we hold up who Jesus is, I want us to also observe how God revealed himself in the Old Testament. And I hope we can see with much clarity who our God is truly and how he has never changed. And with this, I I pray, Lord, that our faith might increase and that our worship of you would abound. So we're going to jump in. It's point one on your outline, the Son versus the Father. So there are profound implications when we actually believe Colossians 1.15 that says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Right? Colossians 1.19 says that in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. 
Hebrews 1.3 tells us that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint, the exact representation of his nature. Now, I touch on this because throughout the book, Gentle and Lowly, we've been asking the question, who is Jesus? What is Jesus really like? What is his heart like? We've observed his great compassion, how he calls himself gentle and lowly in Matthew 11:29. We would affirm, we've seen that he is indeed gracious and so merciful. He has proven his love for us by laying down his life. But there is a subtle danger if we do not quickly read all of the scriptures and remember that Jesus says, I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. In John 8, 28, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. He says in John 10, 32, I have shown you many good works from the Father. So we must see that every kind deed and every gracious word that Jesus spoke, it was not contrary to the Father's heart. No, he was only doing the things that pleased and showed his kind and gracious Father. In John 5, 19, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the son does, that the son, or whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. So every merciful act that we have come to know is our merciful Jesus, right, was because he saw the father of all mercies in what he was doing, and he did likewise. Jesus' heart is the father's heart. And I just want to sit for a moment and worship under that truth. That's an amazing reality. No one has seen God at any time. But God, the only Son, who is in the arms of the Father, he has revealed him. That's John 1.18. That's amazing. Many of us have come to maybe even cherish and be endeared to Jesus through this book, Gentle and Lowly, and obviously through the Word. But I want us to always remember that this is who our Father is. This, as we will see soon, is who God has always been. Now, you may not feel this way today, but I do think that believers, um, we can all have hard thoughts about God, about the Father. Ortland even mentions in this chapter that one of the effects of sin and the fall is that entrenched in our minds are dark thoughts about God. John Owen says that believers often walk around heavy and weak, anxious, fearful even, about the Father's thoughts or acceptance of them. We ought to be rejoicing and confident and strong in the Lord. And I want to show you how we're not alone in having a little bit of a misapprehension about God. Jesus' own disciples who walked with him for three years, right? They were taught by him. They were recipients of Jesus' love, his care, his grace. Yet listen to what Philip asked um, Jesus towards the end of his ministry in John 14, 8. I find this fascinating. He's walked with Jesus. He says, 14.8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Now, there's two things that I just want us to quickly consider about Philip's request. The first is that Philip knows, he truly believes that a sight of God, the Father, will satisfy him. He trusts that if we could just behold the Father... It would leave us completely full, completely content. Do you believe that? Do you believe that beholding God is enough for you? Well, Philip's sure of this, and he wants to see the Father. Show us the Father, he says. It is enough. That's the first thing I observe. The second observation is that Philip is a little misguided. He lacks understanding here. He's not seeing clearly that what he has beheld for three years in Jesus Christ is exactly who the Father is. There is nothing else to show of who God is. There's nothing more to reveal or to add. To know the Son 
is to know the Father. To be received by the Son is to be received by the Father. That is amazing. That is an amazing reality. There is no further, greater manifestation or clear sight that God could give us of himself than his Son. We can be sure of who God is. And I want to mention that nothing of who the Son of God is is at odds with who the Father is, which kind of brings me to point two on your outline. It's Old Testament versus New Testament. So Stephen was telling me a story recently about a man he was speaking to in Guatemala. Back, He said it was 30 years ago. And this man said, I reject the God of the Old Testament. He is harsh. He's angry. He's wrathful. I believe in the God of the New Testament, full of love and mercy. Now, what we hear coming out of this man's heart is very concerning. This is someone who does not understand and know who God is. Our God has never changed. And if we ever find ourselves rejecting or chafing against the revelation of God in the Old Testament, but embracing Jesus, we don't understand who the Father is or who Jesus is. And that's really important. We surely won't understand the cross. Our God was, is, and will always be holy, holy, holy. He is good, and he will always be a just and righteous judge. And he must, he must, and we praise him for it. He must judge wickedness and sin. His wrath is not an injustice. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. His judgments are true and just, and the judgments of God, even the wrath of God, is not exclusive to the Father. Our God is one. He has never changed. And I was marveling recently in Revelation, as I was just considering how God has revealed himself in the Old Testament. You see him in his son, Jesus. And then you look at this future picture in Revelation of people worshiping the Lord and Jesus Christ as he rightly judges as his wrath is being poured out. They are singing a song from their hearts, worshiping, saying, we give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants. That's Revelation 11, 17, 18. In 15.3, they sing the song of the Lamb, saying, Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. In 16.7, they say, True and just are your judgments. Do we sing that in our heart? Do we know this God, the Father and the Son, as one? Is there anything about him that we misunderstand or chafe against? We need our minds to be renewed. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. That's John 5, 22. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, the Lord Jesus, I quote, the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, end quote. The holiness and justice of God must be understood rightly. It's in the Father and it's in the Son. Our God is one. He's never changed. And what makes us fall on our knees, ladies, is when we behold this righteous, holy, just God who will judge my sin, our sin, and we see that he is the most gracious and merciful Lord. 
who according to his great love made provisions for us while we were still weak. While we were still sinners and we hated him. It was the father that sent his son to be the savior of the world. Everyone knows that from Awana. 1 John 4, 14, if you have kids. God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God the Father put forth his son that he might be just and yet justify the sinner. Romans 3, 26. This is an amazing thing that God's righteous wrath for our sin against him has been poured out on the son fully and believe that and worship him for that. And what I love is that he purposed that we might be only recipients of mercy, that we would now spend now and eternity acquainting ourselves with his love. We have been brought near to God to enjoy and not be afraid of this holy, holy, holy God. He wants to pour out his grace on us. His wrath is finished for those of us who trust in Jesus. How could we ever have a hard thought about this God? I mean, think about it. How could you ever doubt his care for you? I mean, how could one ever reject the God of the Old Testament or find them different than Jesus as revealed in the New Testament? It is spurning this great love and rejecting this great God that stores up for an unbeliever his holy and just judgment. Now, I hope that this might bring clarity to misapprehensions that we might have about God. And honestly, I hope it brings confidence to a believer's heart about how God has always been a God of great mercy and love, and he will always be a God of holiness and justice. Our God was a judge then, and his son will judge when he returns. Our God has never changed. And this will lead me to point three, the Lord, the Lord. So God proclaims his own name. Let's see if I just misrepresented him. He proclaims his own name in Exodus 34. And though it's a familiar passage, um, I hope we're not indifferent to what we're about to read, right? Or think that we've fully comprehended what this means, what he's about to proclaim. This name and this God we will spend eternity beholding and praising. And it is a privilege to know him. So Exodus 34, I want us to see if what Jesus has revealed to us in flesh and blood, we've been going through gentle and lowly, we've noticed all these things about Jesus, what he has revealed to us, is this what God spoke of himself through words in the Old Testament times? So if you look, if you have your Bible, or I'll just read it, um, if you recall in Exodus thirty-three eighteen, 18, Moses had asked the Lord, please show me your glory. And the Lord says, I will make all my goodness. Everything we're about to hear about who God is, is good. All of his goodness will pass before you and will proclaim before you my name. Exodus 34, 6, this is what the Lord says. The Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in faithfulness and truth, who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives wrongdoing, violation of his law, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the punishment of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Now, lest we even start to think or accuse God of evil for inflicting punishment on fathers and then on their children. I want us to see something very quickly in Exodus 20, verse 5. You can also find this in Deuteronomy 5, verse 9, or Deuteronomy 7, verse 10. But Exodus 20, verse 5, he adds, he says the very same thing, but he adds a very insightful, helpful detail. 
He says, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. We are not an innocent people. We are born sinners. Every generation sin passed down. Rejection of God is in our hearts. Rebellion. Hatred of God. And this sin, when met with a holy and just God, deserves wrath. But the Father never was a mean God who poured out wrath on those who turned to him for salvation. Ever. He never did that to those who love him. The Father is righteous and good. He punishes the guilty as he should. His justice, might I add, is not an afterthought. It is who he is. Our God is just and righteous and good. And we saw this. Jesus is exactly the same. And I think this is what makes our salvation, this, not think, I know God, this makes our salvation so sweet. When you trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, that he has fully taken the wrath of God off of you and placed it, on, poured it out on his son. You are forgiven. It is finished. It is fi- there is no more wrath for us, which means there's no fear for us when he returns. We ought to be a confident people. So he calls himself going through, again, compassionate, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in faithfulness and truth, keeping faithfulness, forgiving wrongdoing, law, sin, not leaving the guilty unpunished. Has he changed? No. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In Jesus, we see God in the flesh. And I hope that through these minutes together, that we have seen a piece of who God is, and that we are more than sure that our God has never changed, and he will never change. And what confidence that ought to bring us. What assurance. May we never misunderstand God and run from him. Jesus Christ suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? That he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3.18 So ladies, let us go and see what kind of love the Father has bestowed on us that we have been called children of God. This understanding of God and insight into his love doesn't just happen walking around. We have to go to the word of God and cling to it, read and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. Read all of the Bible. Read the Gospels. As we, Joe was even saying, behold the Lamb of God. See him. Let us know and be acquainted with his precious and very great promises the grace that he gladly provides for us. Let's put ourselves under that fountain every day. And through all of this, as the psalmist said in the beginning, those that know you will put their trust in you. Believe who he says he is, is indeed who he actually is. And ladies, may we be strong, confident, and rejoicing in the Lord always. That's all I got for you. So I'm going to pray. Close your eyes, please, ladies. Lord, um, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for your son. Lord, why you would even think to come and rescue sinners who hate you is something we will just worship and marvel at for eternity. We are not worthy, Lord. 
And yet, because of your great love and according to your grace and mercy, you rescued us, God, and I thank you for that. I pray for every woman in this room that they would cling to Christ, that they would trust him, Lord, who he is as the Son of God, the very image of the invisible God, and what he's done, how precious his blood was, that he has cleansed us from all of our sin. You fully, Lord, you fully poured out your wrath on him. There is no more wrath on us. We are children of God. Father, help us to understand and appreciate, be thankful for that reality. And I pray, God, that we would come to know what it means. What it means when you say that you did not spare your own son, but gave him up for us. How will you not also graciously give us all things? Let us trust that, God, and grow in our understanding that you are a God who richly provides for us. We love you. Correct our thinking. Renew our minds. May we worship you as holy, holy, holy. Amen.